Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name is Dulte Dahardi and in this podcast series, I will be speaking to investors, advisors, entrepreneurs and recruiters who are based all over the world and we'll be discussing how to set up, scale and operate a world-class recruitment company. So today I have a world-class recruiter on the podcast. Her name is Kara Atkinson. She is one of the best sales and marketing recruiters in Australia and has been building massive numbers for you for almost 17 years now. She started off in Page, worked for a few search firms and has run her own company for over 11 years. Um, I've come across her in the Herc Facebook group run by David Stephen Patterson and uh, she's using David at the moment to increase her digital footprint in her marketplace to go along with all the traditional recruitment techniques that sh- that have made her really successful throughout the years. She's deliberately decided not to scale and uh, runs a really profitable independent recruitment shop. Worth, uh, worth listening to this one if you are thinking of going out on your own. You don't have to hire lots of people and create a call center. You could just be really shit hot at what you do. Over to Cara. A big shout out to our sponsors, Interview. Um, really grateful for the partnership that we have with Interview and for them letting me use their product in recompense for giving the odd shout out on the podcast here. Um, I get a lot of value out of their product so far. Um, as I'm speaking, I'm doing a lot of videos on their Hintro product, which means that I can send a video to my first LinkedIn connections. They can watch the video and then I'll know who's watched it. And I'm trying to do a video for every scenario so my team can automate as much of the process as possible and get me calls with the best people out there that I need from a a client and a candidate perspective. So I'm really enjoying this collaboration and I can't recommend it enough. Hi. Cara Atkinson, how are you doing today? I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, wonderful. The the English summer is in full bloom. So on so for once I'm not moaning about the weather over here. <laughs> well, I'll swap you. I think it's about six degrees over in Sydney tonight. So oh, man. So uh welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. We've had uh, we've had some back and forth on uh, DSP's recruiter group on Facebook. Are you getting much value out of uh, out of connecting with uh, other people in the industry online? I am actually, particularly in that group. You know, I think it's really set up for sole operators and people that are, have gone out on their own. So very relevant. And, um, you know, you can feel it's very easy to feel isolated when you're setting up shop solo. So it's great to get back connected into the Herc, as it's, as it's called. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and you've listened to an episode of this before, have you? I have actually. Um, you interviewed a mate of mine, Kylie Clark, who's an absolute star. Okay, another superstar female yeah, entrepreneur so- in Australia. <laughs> yeah, she said to me, um, "You, oh, you've got to know Jawata. He's he knows everybody in the industry." And and then a second message for good was, or don't bad. To- <laughs> <laughs> and then a second, her second point was, "And don't listen to my podcast." But I hear it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, she was absolutely amazing, and uh, and an investor listened to her episode and has bought into her new business. So, that, Boom. I know that was uh, I was like, that's <laughs> that's kind of nice making a wee difference like that. Um, Did you send over a um, retainer or an invoice? Yeah, absolutely. It's in the post. <laughs> yeah, because uh, search firm owners are so generous like that. <laughs> really great to work with. <laughs> yeah. Love it. yeah yeah we want more service but we'll uh we'll not pay a retainer <laughs> all right <laughs> and you just take this person <laughs> i know um so this isn't your first rodeo in recruitment you've been uh you've been around the block a bit hey yeah 18 years or something ridiculous ah, like that. 18 I years 
I know. I came in. I was one of those weirdos that that actually wanted a recruitment a, a recruitment career. I didn't fall into it like so many other people do. I I um I always enjoyed the experience of being, and so I decided to get into the industry. And I went and met with about seven or eight different agencies back when I was twenty three, I mm. think. Um, and I went and met with a big generalist and went with and met with small boutiques and I was lucky enough to get a few contracts on the table and I decided back then to join um, an agency that was known for being the best training and development in the industry, which is Michael Page. And oh, they'll tell um, you that anyway. <laughs> well, and I hey, was definitely Hayes will tell you I the same and so will Robert Walters. <laughs> <laughs> and I definitely drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah, but so, you have um, to, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was the right decision. I was there for five great years. Wow. And um, it was really interesting because I was, I was sort of working right in Sydney Harbour or living right on Sydney Harbour when I took the role. And so I was presuming I was going to start in their city office and um, work a desk in there. But the night before I started, they rang me and said, would you be interested in working at our Parramatta office? And I said, Parramatta, which I'm not sure what the London equivalent is, but it's Western Sydney. It's West and you know, I, I needed to check if they still had running water out yeah. there at the time. It's Essex, isn't oh. it? It's, uh... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although I think that's on the east, but yeah, it's a, uh, or it's probably Reading, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so... yeah, it's it's out there. It's like a big manufacturing yeah. industrial town. And and actually it ended up being the, the most absolute stroke of fate because I, I went out to Parramatta. I was in Western Sydney. I went into a, onto a sales and marketing desk and at the time, 18 years ago, I was um, a, a kind of unique because, first of all, I was Australian in recruitment. That was very unusual 18 years ago. Is everyone Even 10 years ago when I was there. Yeah. <laughs> like some so of the managers was, maybe, but uh, yeah. like middle-class yeah. Australians, they, they, they're not in recruitment. <laughs> I know. What are you doing? Well, Plus yeah. the fact that I was female. Plus the fact that I was working um, the manufacturing, industrial and construction sector. Yeah. So I just kind of found it easy to generate meetings pretty quickly just by simply being those three things. And mm. um, and to this day, 18 years on, I've continued to focus and niche hard into that same sector. It seems to have worked for me. So that's amazing. I'm not gonna, and yeah, I'm not gonna that. five years with Michael Page, you all, you were almost institutionalized. <laughs> There's a fine line there. Like, Michael Page is good, Walters is good, Hayes is good, but they don't teach you too much entrepreneurial skills. No, you're right. I mean, you know what it was? I, the reason that I ultimately made the call to move on is that at the time they only had really one career path and it was if you wanted to manage teams and yeah. managing people never really interested me. I loved billing and I loved being I was very competitive and I wanted to be on top of the revenue league table, but I never – never was interested in, in, you know, managing and babysitting people. And so they just couldn't show me that career path where it had worked before. And so that's ultimately, you know, I got the headhunting call from a boutique search firm um, who was specialising in my discipline and they kind of started talking to me about the commission structure and it was so vastly different, I, I made the move. Yeah. So the, the headhunt call went something like... <laughs> How, you build 200k yeah. a quarter, we'll pay well, you 60 grand yeah. a quarter. And I was and, like, okay, and, I'll start and, on Monday. Yeah, yeah, and right now you're going to get 10% at uh, <laughs> at Michael yeah. Page and it's discretionary. Yeah. If... Discretionary, absolutely. <laughs> hey, that's the greatest trick the devil ever ever pulled. <laughs> well, yeah, at the time going in as a new salesperson, I thought that their um, couple of grand a quarter was amazing. And then, yeah. and then um, yeah, the next next couple of years was a little bit of a whirlwind for me because I started earning some serious cash. I, I was really appreciative of it, actually, at the time because I felt like I got a lot of stuff handed to me in terms of training, process, clients, a team around you. I kind of thought, oh, you know, if you're in your first few years, it's actually quite a good, good way to 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 learn and get into the industry. I did three years at Walters, but yeah, uh, I would, yeah, definitely never. I would all, you know, that that time was the the biggest benefit, and and in fact, I use it today when I'm selling against the big generalists because I know how they work. Yeah, and um, and so it was amazing bonus for me when to start it off that way, and I deliberately chose that business because of their training and development and 
but and, and the practices still come into my work today in terms of whether I'm winning against them or losing to them. I know how it, I know how it works in there now. So it's it has been beneficial, absolutely. Um, and I've made great friends. I'm still friends with to this day. And uh, and what was that like going from Michael Page to a boutique? Was it a big culture it shock? A, oh, the the worst. I went to a husband and wife team. <laughs> hey, there's ever. nothing wrong with them. So the, the only, I think the only achievement I've written on my resume for that period of 10 months was the fact that I lasted for 10 months. Yeah. I absolutely was, failed um, coming out of Walters as well. It was, uh, uh, but like, you don't realize how much the machine is taking care of you as much as anything else. Like, it's, yeah, I know. I think maybe because you've got more people, if there's any dickheads in the group, then you've got other people to bounce things off. But when it's just five or six people around you, it really, it really highlights it. And it was a strangely competitive situation with the owner and his wife and just wasn't a place where I wanted to be. And, in fact, then the next move on to Bilby Executive Search, I, I really never felt entirely at home until probably until I started my own business. But I do have to say I had an amazing mentor at Bilby um, who's a guy that's been in recruitment for his entire career. He's now probably 55 and his name is Tony Horrocks. And okay. he was an amazing mentor of mine. He started with Morgan and Banks and kind of went all the way through the industry in Australia. What, uh, what did you learn in executive search specifically? I, I have my own thoughts about executive search. Um, I'm not, I feel like, I feel like they dress, they window dress up a process and, I I almost think I don't know like if 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 a good contingency specialist recruiter can sell a retainer there's not much difference Only... I, I totally agree they're an executive search consultant and yeah. and in fact what's interesting now is when you talk to candidates that have go, gone through the two experiences that if you're good in that contingent space um and, and selling at a lower level, you give them the same experience that they, that they have with the, you know, the, the big search firms, um, mm. global search firms. So I agree, it's pretty packaging. I, I think it's still human relationships at the core of it and um, and businesses still make the same buying decision that they do whether they're going into search or whether they're going into a contingent or a, or a more junior retained role. So, yeah, I mean, it's all just how it's packaged up. And so I've certainly, again, used that in my own business to how I go out to market. So you, so you, you had, like, you were relatively at home at Page, but something was missing. Um, and you thought maybe that's a boutique. Money. And then, yeah, money. <laughs> and then you thought, oh, maybe maybe it's executive search. That'll, that'll make me feel good about myself. What was the day that you decided, do you know what? I'm just going to do this myself. Actually, I, it was a funny situation. I was looking down at my stomach and it was becoming bigger and bigger and bigger with my first baby. And I got to 36 weeks pregnant. And as we all know in the recruitment industry, there's a real culture of being chained to your desk. You know, you're there at 8 a.m. and you're there at 6 p.m. And then when you're not there, you've got the card behind the bar and it's that kind of that's just the recruitment industry. And I just thought becoming a mum, how am I going to find flexibility and freedom with an employer? And I really just couldn't see anyone that had made it work. And especially back then, what what, what year are we talking? Uh, 2007. Okay. So, and, and I also had on the other side of me is all my clients saying, you know, we'll follow you wherever you go. So I thought, well, I, I want to take a year off to have this baby anyway. So why don't I just, um, I, I, we'd moved to Queensland for my husband's work and I thought I'll just, and so I, I was sort of separating ways anyway with that, with, with Bilby. Um, I had an offer on the table to move to Queensland, but it wasn't quite right. So I just decided to finish up. So, um, yeah, so she, so the baby was about two, two weeks old and, she was at my feet and I had butcher's paper up on all the walls and did my business plan. And in that very first week, I think I did a national sales manager role and I just never forget the feeling. It's a two week old baby. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that I knew that I knew the candidate. I knew the, obviously they told me the role and I knew exactly who it was. So it was, it was a very quick process. So mm. I didn't have to do too much. I didn't have to interview anyone. I knew who it was and, and then charged the fee for it. And that feeling that I had when I, 
actually typed into the invoice the number and then actually translated into my bank account, I was kind of hooked. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, how long were you in Queensland for? Um, about 18 months. It was an amazing market at the time. You just had to, you 100% conversion rate, you pick up the phone, someone would meet with you. Um, for and... anybody listening, that was down to the resources sector, wasn't it? Um, it was just, I don't know, again, the Aussie female in Brisbane at the time. I just don't think anyone else is cold calling and I actually never minded it. So I just did that hardcore. And, um, and, and so it was, I think, you know, I was sort of working about 20 hours a week in that first year and, and sort of did, I don't know, four or 500 K I think at the time. Um, and um, and then we had to come back to Sydney. My husband wasn't happy with his work, so we came back to Sydney and I just the business just kind of cruised along and I added another two babies. I had three kids under three. And the, oh, and my the God. I know. So we have, know. Two, look, we have two under two. Three. Oh, my God. You're two under three two and under a half. Two? What, have you got twins? No, no, no. So Connor's two and a half and Huey's just one. So. Um, oh, two under two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two under two. Yeah. But God. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Like, I mean, you're, you're still work, you're still in Disneyland with two, by the way. Ramp it up to three and we'll talk. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um, Stop. Um, yeah, so I had the three under three and, and the business. And I honestly look back at that time in my life and just think it's the Bermuda Triangle. How did I pull that off? How did you pull it off? Well, I just... Um, did you have I, much family I went, support? I had a nanny. No, no, no. Everyone, mum and dad moved away from us. <laughs> 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 they moved far, far away. So no, I had a full time nanny, and that was that was um, challenging as a mum because the kids knew that I was in the house, but not in the house, and um, and so we had to work through that. So yeah, I had a full time nanny for three years, and then as they got older, I started to put them into daycare, and and I wasn't ever working full time. I was only ever doing huh. you know twenty. 30, I sort of needed to do about twenty hours a week to sort of make that four or five hundred k was sort of my number. That's unbelievable. Um, and and then what did your husband get a job back in Sydney then? Or? Yeah, so he transferred back, so he was all good. What does and he do? Um, he works for a commercial painting and building company, so um, he's worked in that sector for kind of his whole career. Um, and Very he good. now works for my, my brother is in the same industry. That that's how I met my husband. They were they were the dream team of the industry, and Andrew <laughs> brought him home one day for a barbecue, and that sort of all went from there. Oh, very good. Um, how'd the recession treat you? I I don't want to be one of those assholes, but actually, it did not impact. In fact, I made more money through it. That's because Australia didn't really have one. Well, they, they, they pretend they did. They didn't really, it. though. Mm, a lot of people do talk about the GFC even to this day. You know, they go back through that period of two thousand and seven and eight. And, they didn't have work. It, it still comes up, but I, I don't think we experienced it anywhere near like what you guys did. Well, we and, all moved um, to we all moved to Australia. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, that's when I started the business. You know, I started in two thousand and seven, and and had consistent year on year growth. So, I and I didn't really feel that that issue. Did you scale the business at any stage? Oh my god, I had. The worst history. I, I'm the irony of the recruiter who can't recruit, right? Um, I have put other recruiters in. I've I've sort of had four or five recruiters in the business and then we've kind of parted ways. And I think um, I have a real issue with standards um, and my name is literally hanging on the door. And so... Um, and, and keeping in mind, I was the girl that didn't want to manage any people at Michael Page. And mm. So just because I owned a business didn't necessarily mean I now had this skill base and allowed me to do that. So it's just not my sweet spot. I don't enjoy doing it. I'd much prefer to be out winning business and mm. um, and people that are afraid to pick up the phone. I just, it just doesn't do it for me. So I've tried, I sort of thought, and that was my version of success. You know, when I've got an empire around me and people and, only that would be successful and I didn't really tweak about what was actually going on that I was building a really, you know, successful business that didn't require a lot of hours. That was a huge profit margin. I, I just, it, it, and and the key there, Cara, is, is it, it's really tough because that's a lot of that's ego, isn't it? You know, you're, 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 we're in an ego driven business and, and, and you see your peers and they're scaling companies 
and you're like, I should be doing that. I should, I should be doing that. And then you start taking for granted that actually well, you can work when you want, that you're way more profitable, that, you know, you can choose who your clients are, that you don't have to babysit people, that you've a load of good things, but yet you just say, well, I, I, I still have to keep up with everybody out there. Well, and it's, you're right. It's typically the first question you get asked is how many people work for you? And um, I, rightly or wrongly, I've created a high touch business where my clients are, are very used to me being across everything from cradle to grave. And that has meant that it's really hard to scale. And, and mm. you know, I've started, I've obviously started another company because of that and probably learnt my lessons from that about the downside of hanging your name on the door and, and creating such a high touch business that you can't replicate yourself. So I've definitely learned from a, a mistake there that I don't know whether I'll ever be able to turn that around. I'm not sure. I it's still in an un, unknown basket at this point. Yeah. I mean, I mean that myself, um, but our, our model definitely isn't as high touch as what, what it is in Australia for anybody listening. Australia, Australian recruitment requires a lot of attention. People are very needy, clients-wise. Service is kind of put on a pedestal way more than other marketplaces where it can be a bit more transactional. In in Australia, it, I don't know, it's, it, it's like high services is expected all the time and relationships are, are really key. Isn't that fair to say? Well, that's really interesting. I just assumed that was recruitment. I didn't know that you had any different experience in any other country. Oh yeah, like like the, I mean, in uh, in the UK, I mean, you don't need to meet your candidates, you don't need to meet your clients. Like it, most of them are, most of the companies that are scaling around the world, and um, they'll have started doing America from the UK, and you know they're obviously not able to meet their cl- candidates or clients. A lot of them are doing Germany right now from the UK, and they're the highest growth companies out there. And it's get a candidate. Make sure, you know, do all the right things, but essentially get them out, get on to the next and get them out. And in in Australia, it's, it's usually the first phone call, you're told where to go. Second phone call, they have a bit of banter with you. The third, they'll meet you for a coffee. Then you meet them for a drink. It's it's a tough dating process, but then they're they're a lot more loyal to you, to you once you kind of prove yourself there than in other marketplaces that's just my experience no that's really interesting i mean i I agree with you it definitely is that kind of um dating period beforehand where you get to know each other and and there's a little bit of a slow dance there but once you've proved yourself you you tend to own their entire team nationally and and do everything for them yeah so america's Um, the opposite america is like prove 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 yourself first and then maybe someday i'll meet you for a coffee Oh wow! It would be totally unacceptable to my clients and to me. I would to ever shortlist anybody that hadn't been interviewed face to face. I wouldn't even like even Skype or Zoom. I'd struggle with because you know eyeballing can be a different scenario. Yeah, but I mean that's just. I mean when you when you look at some of the biggest billers in in the world like Rich Rosen, like he does it all from he does it all from his. Uh, his house in Boston and you know, he's, he's closing deals in San Fran all over. And it's the same with, with quite a lot of people in that group, the Herc. It's just a, be- a very big cultural, cultural difference. Yeah. Um, he's definitely on my radar actually, Rich. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am intrigued. And the cool thing is, is that obviously, you know, I've got David um, Patterson, David um, DSP as my, as my mentor. And I deliberately selected him because the states are about 10 years ahead of what we do here. And so anything that, that DSP recommends that I do, it's um, disrupting um, what other recruiters are doing in Australia. So um, it's been a really um, good choice, I guess, to have him involved in the business because, not, you know, people are just not working at the same level or having to cut through like they need to here in Australia like they do in the States. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump in. Let's jump into into that. So he had a look at your, your business you're like you're doing really well you've built consistently for years like you're well known in in doing like say it's predominantly sales isn't it is it is it a niche within sales sales and marketing quite broadly sales and marketing 
Yeah, pretty broadly. It used to be that well, it was always that industrial manufacturing construction sector, but it's pretty – I'm doing most stuff across industry now, so I've got a few FMCG clients and that sort of stuff. What, and So when you sat down or when you, when you Skyped, David, what, what were your pain points? What did you – were you thinking, like, how can I – because you're so service-orientated – like, how can you multiply yourself? Yeah, totally. I was, I, I thought I'm maxed out and I'm just never going to be able to get to the, the seven figures. I just, it's out of my reach and I can't be doing anything more than what I'm doing. Yeah. And so the cool thing that he did within a couple of weeks is, and I, I just, the revenue was coming from lots of roles that I felt like, you know, if I could do less roles at a more senior level, it would be a better business. And so that's why I, I connected with him and, Within a couple of weeks, he had shown me some techniques to create that omnipresence, you know, his favourite word. Yeah. And um, it changed the game in that when I went into meetings, rather than pitching, the client was pitching to me. They knew <laughs> you already. Yeah. So yeah. That, and- it's really interesting um, how, how, how it just really sh- shifted in those meetings Um compared to what I've been slogging out for 18 years. Yeah, it, it, it fascinates me, but you're the ideal pupil for any digital marketing person because you've got a track record, you've got loads of data, and like it, you're, you're already there. All you, you kind of needed was for somebody to, you know, document that, target that appropriately and get that out there. But, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's yeah, I mean, great I've that been, it's worked. I, 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 yeah, I had a lot of I've had a lot of digital marketing specialists approach me and want to work with me. But the reason I chose DSP and the reason it was the right decision is that he's got his own recruitment business on the side, so he's implementing the same strategies in real time. And um, mm. I, I couldn't see another headhunter globally that that had that level of social media or digital marketing knowledge that he does. So I think that's why I just totally trusted what he was saying because I knew he was doing it for his own business and I could see that scaling. And so I thought, well. You know, if he's doing it, then I'll just I'll drink the Kool Aid and and do what he says. That's brilliant, and you're you're starting to reap the rewards on it now, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's been a really cool quarter. I, in fact, I had to turn off I had to turn off the mentoring because, um, you know, I sort of have fifteen or sixteen retained roles, and I just it was going crazy, and so I had to turn off all the automation, and I had to turn off all the robots, and I had to turn off DSP himself. I couldn't make our meetings because I, <laughs> I just needed to fill the roles and. It, to to talk about what some of those things are, so, um, like what 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 type of things did did, did you implement in terms of uh, you mentioned robots and and that yeah yeah so the 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 AI part of it like I I just because again you know I'm high touch and I'm doing everything from from the garden from the start and I've got lots of kind of cool stuff done I've got lots of videos and I've got some really cool white papers but they didn't really have um, a strategy that was pulling them all together and sending them out to market so kind of he helped me create a funnel and you know look at the customer journey um, about when how they come in and then and then when they're ready to to buy Um, so to have that a lot more automated than what it's ever been before which is very manual me waking up at three o'clock in the morning and thinking shit I've got to call that person Mm. Um, so it's it's definitely helped from automation we've still got a ways to go so I've actually just re-engaged him for another quarter because I only took about a third of what his teaching was and then I was kind of away and now I want to go back and put in some more things to get it to the next stage and uh, and then all through Facebook marketing in, in terms of the outreach and uh, and emails. Yeah, Facebook. I was I could swear black and blue. My market's not on Facebook, but that was a surprising thing for a you know thirty five or forty bucks. I think it's cost me, and um, I didn't necessarily get any leads on Facebook, but it just you know the difference in when you pick up the phone and people have seen you and all those different platforms. You know, mm. you book the meeting straight away and again that the feeling in the room when you sit down and people are, are, are trying to sway you to take on their work. It's just, um, it's been a really cool, cool difference. Yeah. And and so did he also push you to retain? He actually, interestingly, I said to him, I only want to do 100% retained and he encouraged me to have um, a percentage of the work as contingent because he said you can automate that process a fair bit. So he's really pushing me to do 
some contingent work. But yeah, I, I don't think there's really a role I've done this year that I haven't taken a portion up front if you consider that retained. Yeah. Um, um, and whenever you do the contingent, you always re- get reminded about why would I have taken this on and done all this work and then not get paid for, for it. Yeah. And do you have like a, have you, have you worked out what, like how you can multiply your sourcing strategy as well? Um, do you mean for the same role over and over again? Mm, well, I mean, you, you're you're doing the digital marketing stuff to get meetings to get retainers whenever you're trying to fill roles is that just you manually going into going oh, into yeah, it right yeah you can use it to find better candidates well definitely using those strategies i reckon my um conversion rate's gone down so i'm sending out less people on a short list with a higher conversion rate to offer whether that's a coincidence i have been in the game for 18 years or just where i'm finding them and actually there's quite a big percentage now that are those magical unicorns that don't exist online. Um, so I'm finding people that aren't necessarily on LinkedIn or have deleted their profile um, oh. through using those different strategies on Facebook and, and other means as well. So, and, and, you know, if you can tell a client that you're going to deliver someone that's genuinely nowhere that they can find them, obviously your stock goes up by, by a lot. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's interesting that you, you went down this road after – being so long set in your ways i know and i think sometimes he must grind his teeth at me because um it takes me probably longer than most to 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 add the next thing in the next week and he's got a very high um, (laughs) expectation of what you put in and and I, i think you know he takes you on expecting you don't have anything else to do and so I would sometimes sheepish, sheepishly turn up to our meetings and go, oh, that's not quite done. Um, <laughs> and, um, and not being a digital marketing expert at all, even though I recruit those roles, I've got no idea what goes on behind the scenes. There is a fair bit of grunt work that's required. And so, um, and, and you're right, you do get in a comfort zone. I always do it this way, why would I change it? But when you're getting better quality roles and getting retained for stuff over and over again, you know, there's merit to, to, following, to following the Bible. And and what's the second business that you've that you've launched? Yeah, so this is really exciting. This um, so for the last two years in my recruitment business, I have been hosting a quarterly lunch for my sales leaders, and so I bring in a really cool speaker and I put lunch on for about fifty five or sixty people, and um, it's really created it sort of created a really good vibe in the room people were being um the defenses were down the vulnerability was showing we have a no dickheads policy in the room and and that was that was really what was happening and people were sharing what was really going on and i made it specifically for sales leaders and so two years ago when i started doing it i thought if i could just get one one roll out of the room then this is a really cool way to much cooler than cold calling um and we all get you know have have a wine and and have a chat and listen to this good speaker and so when at the last lunch in, I think it was February, I was sort of bombarded afterwards about how much people were loving the events and how connected they were feeling in a really isolated role. You know, head of sales is the only one of its kind in a business and it's frontline and it's hardcore and they're managing teams of 60 or 70 people. And I was kind of connecting people with each other that were working in similar roles. And so I got all these text messages and I had that sudden thought at 3 a.m. and I got up, got my phone, and I Googled, what is the network for sales leaders in Australia? Um, because we have here the CEO Institute, the CEOs, marketing directors have AMI, mm. um, HR directors have ARI. You know, virtually every discipline within a corporate has an association or a network that they can join, but there wasn't one for sales leaders. And I had a quick look at the oh, UK. Eureka. At, at, <laughs> I had a quick look at the States. I couldn't see one there. I had a quick look at the UK. I couldn't really see anything prominent there. And there was one obscure one in Ireland, but I thought, you know what, if there's not one in Australia, who better? I've got 18 years in this space. I'm going to have a crack at it. So I started um, Spark is what it's called. And it's bizarrely spelled Spark with a C because I couldn't register Spark with a K. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and so it's a membership network where um, it's specifically for sales leaders. So you can't join unless you're managing more than 20 million revenue and unless you've got more than five direct reports. And I launched it. Um, Why did you ago. choose twenty million? 
I just didn't want any Thai kickers. Hmm. And ten, I, I ten really, million, not I enough. Just, well, I just feel like this, this, th- that group of people, twenty million and above in corporate Australia, are typically the people that are setting up sales training for their team, but nothing for them. They're kind of forgotten about. And I was interviewing them, you know, sales leaders in my recruitment business, yeah. and I was interviewing them at year one. They were going in, and they're coming out at year five, and they hadn't gone through a single course. They hadn't been mentored. They were actually no better a leader unless they'd had an amazing mentor. Um, and so I really felt really passionate that these guys are sort of the forgotten ones and quite isolated. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it was sort of my recruitment experience that was telling me that was the right way to go. Good. And- um, so, yeah, we launched, it, we launched it a couple of weeks ago and you get a whole range of things in your membership. It's um, obviously all the events and the lunches, but there's also a learning academy at, at the epicenter of Spark where – Every month I'm doing something similar to this podcast, actually, where I'm doing a Zoom with a thought leader on a particular area of sales leadership content and they receive that on email every month um, and it's real cutting-edge stuff with, you know, that is is more than how do we structure your territories or, you know, what does a good customer look like? It's really pushing the envelope in terms of thinking about customers differently and um, and so yeah, we've got we've got fifteen members, and of those fifteen, they collectively are managing one point eight billion in revenue, and more than four hundred and fifty direct reports. So my wow. my my foundational fifteen are heavy hitters, and I expect that business to to quickly outpace recruitment. Actually, yeah, I was gonna. So I was gonna ask you that. How are you gonna do both? I don't know. Got an idea? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that girl's going to have to suck it up and hire people again. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> no, I think the the spark is fun, and I look at I look one of my um, you know, fangirl moments is Emma Isaacs who set up Business Chicks, and she took it to the US recently, and and how she built that. She was also an ex recruiter that started it up, and I can definitely see um the the you know the the lure of the shiny new thing of this membership network and you know the the goal for that for spark is that i want to get it to 200 members in the first year and then once i have those 200 members i can go out to boards globally and say you know what if you come into australia and you want to set up shop typically your first hire is the sales leader and if you come into this country cold and and then go to a search firm you don't know who you're getting really you can reference check them but you don't really know but if you hire from within Spark, you know they get this entire toolkit where they're ready to hit the ground running for you. Yeah, it makes sense. All makes sense. Um, but you're going to have to hire people. Yeah, well, it's not called. At least it's not doesn't have my name on it. So I, it's probably easier to do that um, to, yeah. to put a put a good GM in and, and, and keep it running. So at the moment, um, yeah, we'll, we'll just just suck it up and see what happens. Well, look, it's uh, it's been great getting to know you and uh, and hearing your success story. I'm sure it's inspiration for uh, for anybody who's thinking of going out on their own and doesn't really know what direction they want to go in. Like you've proven that you can kind of do it all yourself. You have a you have a bit of administration help as well, do you? Yeah, I've got I've got a full time PA, um, and she's a magician on my on my diary and all that sort of stuff. I wouldn't be able to survive without that person, but um. And I, and I have someone that helps me with from a branding perspective when I want a new brochure or a case study to go out. Um, and I had someone doing sourcing, but it wasn't really working. I, again, really needed to get into it. So that, that, that person's now no longer there either. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the sourcing piece is tough. Like I have, we've worked on that for a long time. So I have a third member of staff starting on the sourcing side soon. Oh, do you? Yeah. But my wife has a whole, she's 22 page manual done up on how to do it and how to hire them and all the rest. Oh, um, wow. You should, um, you should be selling that. Maybe, maybe. I'll buy one. Yeah, I know. People would, people would. But I think the the tricky piece is like she would have to, she would have to do the implementation because it kind of always has to be unique to the, the training manual has to be unique to the search firm owner. Um, I'll yeah, let Charlotte, I mean, that Charlotte was, could that do. That was my it, issue when I was yeah. yeah when I was looking at the email responses and all that sort of stuff using a saucer versus using mine, you know there was fifty percent fifty percent difference, and I I couldn't ignore the data that people just you know feel probably 
you know, nicer about being um, contacted by a director rather than by a source. You know how the human nature works. They want to be flattered and they want to be coerced to the table and, and someone that's got 18 years of experience versus someone who's just a contractor, it does make a difference from their perspective. Sure it does, but uh, the sourcer could be in your LinkedIn account. Oh, well, I, did a, I didn't tell you about that. I, how many times I've been locked out by LinkedIn, someone else getting into my computer. Do you have LinkedIn Recruiter? I have. I spend $45,000 with that platform every year. I have everything, and they still try and shut out my PA for getting into my messages wow. just to work out how to schedule my diary. That would break my heart. Um, oh, I just, I, I don't know what I was, I've had so, so many meetings with them. I just, I don't know. They just don't seem to care anymore. They no, used to. They, they definitely don't care. But if you don't have LinkedIn Recruiter, it's handy I've enough. got recruiter yeah I've got recruiter I've got sales navigator I've got you know I run campaigns on there I've got yeah it's about for a 40k spend every wow. year with, with LinkedIn that's a for 40k uh, AUD so yeah yeah it's uh yeah it's still a lot of money though but uh yeah the the sourcing piece is hard I think like you can you can do it like you can get sources to do it but like we would incorporate like i've i've had andrea for a few years and arena for 18 months and um and now we've got a girl called florina starting and what we would what we because we rebranded to my name i think that that's helped a little bit because the, the straight away my name is getting out there on every message even if they're using their own account um but but given them access to your account, you can't you can do that if you don't have LinkedIn Recruiter. But if, uh, if LinkedIn Recruiter, they're like oh, they, they're oh, right. just so, so hot if you on. Don't it. have it. You can. Yeah. You, you can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do so you, know you get penalised for spending more money, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I'm sure it's against the terms of business either way. But like, yeah, they they're really hot on the LinkedIn Recruiter licenses, aren't they? Oh, just all over it. Like it's just for the wrong reasons. You can't get them to return a phone call if you need some support. But, you know, if someone in the next room uses your login, they're straight on the phone. Um, all right. Well, that's us, uh, Cara. I, we've uh, really enjoyed this chat and I wish you continued success. If Thank you, have you so any... much. Thank you for having me. I really yeah. appreciate having the chat with you. Any advice for any young female founders that are wanting to have it all? look you know any any working mum knows that you're just not going to have it all you can't juggle all the plates you just have to make a decision each day which plate am I going to drop today whether it's the mother plate the the wife plate the um, health plate or the work plate um you know one you just you just can't do it all so I just make a decision every day I'm going to purposely drop that plate today but I'm going to pick up the other three <laughs> I think that's uh, that helps that, anyone but you just yeah. you know and, and I don't think there should be any guilt around any of it. Um, I, I firmly believe, you know, my kids are screening voicemails in the back of the car saying, you know, mum, that candidate didn't leave the number. It was too fast. You can't understand them. Don't, don't meet them. So, you know, we'll, we'll see where they end up at the, in their later life. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much, Cara. Cool. Thanks, Joata. Bye. Massive thank you to Cara for coming on the podcast. And I think we'll all agree she's got a great little business on her hands. And I love the spark idea. She's really on to something there. And I'm sure she'll be super successful from it. If anybody's thinking about a career in Australia, I've been working that market for almost five years. And I lived out there working in recruitment for three years before that. So we know the Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and obviously I, I was a recruiter in Perth market really well. And more than happy to walk you through the visas, the opportunities, what it's like, who you should avoid. And, uh, and yeah, just have an open and honest conversation for any UK or Irish recruiters who want to move over there or for anybody who's in the marketplace already there and feels like they are being undervalued at their current firm, especially if that is one that offers discretionary bonus, as we discussed in the podcast. All right, that is it for today. 
but we, I've got a few podcasts to get out from last week. So stay tuned. We'll be back with more. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.